Hi there, my name is Will and welcome back to another deep dive of workflow components. Today we're going to be looking at inputs and how you can use these to make your flows more dynamic. Now you're probably wondering what is an input? Now an input allows a flow to be parameterized. This is really helpful because it means you can have multiple executions with different inputs and they'll achieve different results. Flow inputs are stored as variables inside of your YAML and they're really easy to update and change and then you can use them by using an expression. Let's jump into a few examples to see this in action. When you're defining an input, there are two required properties, an ID and a type. The ID is the name of your input. You can only have one of these inputs with this name inside of your workflow, and that's how you're gonna reference it throughout your tasks. The other required property is a type. In this example here, we have the type string. Now there are a bunch of optional properties as well, such as display name, which is the name that will come up in the execute menu, like so here. Required, whether you need to have this input at execution or not. A description, so it's easier to know what the input is. And as you can see here, it does turn up in that execution menu, as well as default values as well, so that you can have values such as hello turn up automatically so you don't have to type it in every time. There is also the depends on property, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now there are a bunch of different types of inputs as well, which I'm gonna walk through quickly. So obviously we have strings and integers, and as part of that, you can make these op uh, required properties as well as uh, optional. You can also add a display name property. So when you press the execution menu, it's got a little bit more information. You can also add descriptions to these too. You can also add default value. So you don't necessarily have to have any value when you press execute, but you could have something if you want to make it easy to run quickly. Now on top of strings, we have integers. We also have arrays. We also have booleans and floats. And then we've also got select and multi-select. So you can list the values you want there as well. Then we've got a bunch of time and date time uh, input types. So we've got date time, date, time, as well as duration. And these use all, and all of these use the ISO 8601 format. So if you're unclear on how to format it, that's how you would do it. We've also got duration as a format, as well as file. And then there's also JSON, URI, secret, and YAML. So lots of options there, both from sort of basic types, as well as sort of more complex like formats. You can also do nested strings, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now with all of these inputs, when I press execute, we can actually see it presents this wonderful menu here that tells us where we can input these input values. So what we've got here is uh, the string and that's got our default value in it as it's required, but it's also the optional string that didn't have a default value. And then for the different types, it gives us different input methods. So here for an integer, I can easily just use this plus and minus. For an array, again, I can input it like that. Boolean gives me buttons. Uh, the drop downs, as we can see, give me the values I would expect. And then we get pickers for the date time uh, one as well. So here we can do the date time, the date and the time. Duration is split into this nice format with all of these different uh, options. Uh, there's the choose the file option as well. JSON gives you a nice little formatted box here. Same for URI, uh, YAML as well. And the nested string is just a string. So loads of options there to make that work. Now, here's a simpler example that just has a string input. Now this string input here that we can see uh, is called my string. It has a display name and a default value. So when I press execute, we'll actually see here that we can see that display name is there and we can see our default value, which makes it really easy. Now, if we want to use this input within one of our tasks, we can simply use it with an expression. So here I have a log message and I want to be able to just print out what my string input is. And I can do that very simply by doing inputs.mystring. So when I press execute here and I type hello world, and then press execute, we can see that in this message, it does in fact say the same thing as my input. Now that format doesn't always work because if you've got an input ID that has a little hyphen or a dash inside of it, then you're gonna need to use this sort of more familiar JSON format. So here we can see that I want to pass my file to my shell commands task here, but I'm gonna do that by doing input and then in square brackets using the, the ID as my key here. So it's gonna be able to then pass that information down. And I can see here that when I uh, add a file and press execute, we can see that it does successfully get my file and I can see it here generating the two different ones. 
You can also add validator rules to your inputs. This allows you to enforce a strict set of rules to make sure that the values are suitable for your workflow. In this example here, we've got an integer here that has a minimum and a maximum value. And then for a string, we have a regex value. Now, the main common ones are minimum and maximum, as well as for the time and date formats, we've also got before and after. So here I can press execute and we'll see that it does in fact tell us what those minimum values are. So it's really clear for us when we're trying to execute. And if I do try and input a value that's higher than that, you'll see that it just automatically takes us down to the you know, largest allowable value. Now, we also have an array input type, which is really nice because what you can do here is specify what type the values inside of the array should be. So here we can say the item type is integer and then provide a default value. Now you can provide that as a, an array like so, but you can also provide it as a list format here. So when I press execute, we'll see that we get the same thing. And when I press execute, we'll see it's gonna output both of the inputs in the same format. You can also do nested inputs. So this is really helpful for being able to organize things. Now, in this example, we've got nested.string and nested.in. Now, if I was to do inputs.nested, it will give me both of these values in a JSON format. So let me just give you an example of that. So we'll just call our string hello and our integer two. Now, when I press execute, we'll see that it's going to provide us with both of those values. Now, if I wanted to access just one of those, I can do so by then just doing another dot. And then we can see from the autocomplete here that I can in fact put a string. So here now I'm only going to get that string value. So if I put, you know, A, B, C and one here, we'll see that it does in fact give us just the string value. Really useful if you want to be able to organize your inputs together or maybe be able to pass them as expressions together. Now being able to actually assign what your inputs are is really easy. Now the most common way of doing it is by using the execute button at the top here and being able to just enter them in like you would in the UI. But you can also do it using the Kesha API. So you'll see here that it does say curl command here. And if you scroll that down, it does actually give you a command where you can then pass your inputs as part of the request. So really, really useful if you want to have a separate application do this, which also means you can have any programming language talk directly to Kestra using the API. Here's that same example, but here I've got it running with, on my local host here. And if I copy that and then put it into my terminal, I can see here that when I press enter, it does successfully create a new execution. And if I now go back to the executions tab, we can see just now it did in fact create that execution and give us the output that was inside of our HTTP request. Now you can also execute directly inside of Python using our Python library by doing flow.execute and then you can pass your inputs in as a dictionary. So really easy, but if you would prefer to do it directly with the API, you can do so using the request library. So you're not limited to using the Kestra library, um, but this is how you would do it in other programming languages. For example, here is it in Java, where again, we're making that HTTP request to Kestra and we're passing in a bunch of different inputs using a multi-part entity builder. Now, often we are asked, what is the difference between variables and inputs? Now, put simply, a variable is something that will not change at execution. This is defined inside of your YAML and it will stay that way unless you change it. Whereas an input is something that you can change at the point of execution so that your execution has different values. So a variable is really useful if you've got something where you want to be able to use it multiple times, but you don't wanna to have to repeat yourself. You don't want that value to change between executions. Whereas inputs might be useful if you're trying to do um, various different requests and the URI that you're using is going to change per execution. But if you don't want that URI to change and you're gonna use it multiple times, that's where a variable would come in handy. Now there is also the option to do dynamic variables. So here in this example, we've got a date time and we wanna be able to pass in the current time at execution. But the problem here is this is not a valid date time format. And so when we try and run this, it will just completely ignore this value and it will ask us to enter one. So this isn't ideal but we can actually use the string input type here to be able to pass an expression and then we can render it inside of our task. So now what I've done is I've changed that input type to string and I've got a render function here that is going to render the input. So if I didn't have that render, it would just pass through the now inside of the brackets, which is not ideal. So we can see now that when I execute this, we're gonna be able to see the expression has successfully worked.
In Kestra 0.19, we also introduce conditional inputs, which means you can now build more dynamic workflows by having your inputs depend on one another. In this very simple example, we have got a bunch of inputs around cloud providers, where when you select a different cloud provider, you want later inputs to change what they're showing you to relate to the earlier input. So in this example, if I select Google Cloud, I'm gonna to wanna to be able to see the cloud VM and cloud regions for Google Cloud. And as we can see here, we can see F1 Micro, N1 Standard, for example. But if I change that to AWS, the values now change. So this now reduces the need to have multiple different inputs and makes it much easier to build complicated input workflows. And this all uses the depends on property. So here we can see it says depends on, and it's going to look for the input cloud provider, which is the one at the top here, which is really, really useful. And we can then use that expression property here to be able to fetch the values from our key value store where we're storing it. And we can pass it in the earlier input so that we can make sure that the values there are related to that original input. This means our inputs can be dynamic in real time. Here is a slightly more complicated example that is going to have uh, the same cloud VM part that we just looked at, but it's also gonna have a bunch of other stuff. So this means we can actually hide inputs that we don't even want to see. So when I press execute here, at the moment, I can only see one input, but if I select access permissions, I can now see two different inputs. If I go down to cloud VM, we can see all those ones from earlier. So this is super useful for being able to really clear up what execution inputs you need and make it really easy for people to get the correct values in. Also allows you to hide those ones that are not required because they have not been selected. Another cool thing here is for select and multi-select input types, we've also got allow custom value, which means that even though the values here in this YAML list are selected as AWS, GCP, and Azure, you can in fact actually override that. So here I can select AWS, but let's say I want to use DigitalOcean instead. I can actually just type that in like so. And then here I can just select the option in the dropdown, and now I can actually pass that input into my uh, workflow here, and it can, you can see it actually printed out DigitalOcean. So really, really helpful if you want to be able to make sure that you're not just limited to the YAML list and allow users to override it to make your workflows a little bit more flexible. Inputs are a great way to make your workflows more dynamic by being able to pass through different values at execution to get different outcomes. They are really powerful and there are so much flexibility to how you can use them. So I'd be curious to know in the comments below how you plan to use inputs in your workflows. Don't forget to join our Slack community where you can discuss with us further and make sure to give us a star on GitHub.